Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, on this blessed Sunday, make us worthy to praise your resurrection with pure hearts and with clear consciences. With all the children of your Holy Church, we glorify and thank you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit now and forever. <clears throat> Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the good and merciful Lord, who in his compassion came down to us and became flesh. He chose to taste death to save us, and he descended to the realm of the dead. By his resurrection he gave joy to his disciples and gave light to the nations with the light of his salvation. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O Word of God, who can adequately praise you for the depth of your compassion? And what voice can bless you, for you are above all praise? Neither mind nor tongue can describe the wonders you accomplished on Sunday, the day of your resurrection from the dead. And so with the psalmist David we cry out, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Now, O Christ, our God, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense, which we offer to you, to forgive our sins, give peace of mind to those in distress, and comfort to those who are anxious. Bring back those who are far, and watch over those who are near. Guide the shepherd, sanctify the priest, and purify the deacons, 
Pardon all sinners and guard the righteous. Protect orphans and help widows. Drive away conflicts and put an end to all dissension. Remember the faithful departed and grant them rest in your heavenly kingdom that with them we may celebrate that eternal feast. We raise glory to you, to your blessed Father, and to your living Holy Spirit forever. the sweet fragrance of our incense and make us worthy to announce your resurrection with the angels and to proclaim it along with your women disciples and to rejoice in its victory with your pure apostles. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever. Reading. 
from the letter of Saint Paul to the Ephesians. Barachmor lalaho dilan. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Because of this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if, as I suppose, you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for your benefit, namely, that the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly earlier. When you read this, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and to the prophets in the Spirit. That the Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and co-partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this I became a minister by the gift of God's grace, which has been granted me in accord with the exercise of his power. To me, the very least of all the holy ones, this grace was given. To preach to the Gentiles the inscrutable riches of Christ and to bring to light for all what is the plan of the mystery hidden from ages past in God who created all things. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the principalities and authorities in the heavens. This was according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have a boldness of speech and confidence of access through faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over my afflictions for you, for these are your glory. Praise be to God always. life for our souls. We offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Matthew, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Apostle Matthew writes, and Jesus went from that place 
and he withdrew to the region of Tyre and of Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman of that district came and called out to him, Have pity on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not say a word in reply to her. And his disciples came and they asked him, Send her away, for she keeps calling out after us. And he said in reply, I have been sent only to the lost sheep of Israel, of the house of Israel. But the woman came forward and did him homage, saying, Lord, help me. And he said in answer, It is not right for the bread of the children to be thrown to dogs. And she said, But please, Lord, for even the little dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table of their masters. And Jesus said to her in reply, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be done to you as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that hour. This is the truth, peace be with you. that you not be disheartened by my afflictions, for these are your glory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We often talk about the aspect of being illumined, to receive God's grace, to be illuminated. We talked about it in the Husoyo today. But what does it mean to be illumined? What does it mean to receive light? And it calls to mind you know, as we get older, we reflect over these past years and decades, do we not? And this notion of being illumined reminds me of, well, your servant. Going to the seminary after 12 years of public schooling and how time and again I slammed into the teaching of the church with my secular mind. And how much over years, six, later on teaching for nine in the seminary, Year after year, week after week, day after day, what does it mean to enter in to allow our spirits to be illumined? That is a transformation. I can assure you that in the first months, as I sat in the lecture hall, sat in the classrooms of the seminary, and was told doctrines of the church, which I thought coming from my secular education in the public schools, were completely nuts. And on many occasions I would get up at the sink in my room and look in the mirror and say, you're just, this is insane. Why are you even here? You have a credit card in your pocket, you can walk into town, you can get a flight back to Detroit, this is ridiculous. And yet a voice always said, but if you leave, you'll never know. And every time there was a crisis of a moment in which the faith clearly was confronting this is stupid 19-year-old, Another voice came along and said, hang on, otherwise you won't know. And month by month passed, and the end of the first year came, two semesters, and it's like, well, some of this is interesting. And so he came back for the second year, and it became more interesting. And at this point, the voice no longer had to snag me back from the abyss saying, but you'll never know until arriving at the end of my sixth semester, at the end of my third year, I just kind of laughed and said, well, that's it. You have painted yourself into a corner. You have to do this. That is being illumined by grace. And when Catholics have been confronted by the tens of millions with that reality, 
they instead dropped it and returned to their secular formation of our pagan world. I am profoundly grateful that grace was given to say, don't jump, you'll never know. Don't jump, you'll never know. We all have that experience of having to work our minds over and over again to conform to what the apostolic teaching is. Not my opinion, not my feelings, but what actually is the apostolic heritage handed to us. It's a profound gift. And that's what today's epistle is actually about. St. Paul is about 60 years old. He's in prison. As I've mentioned earlier this week, from the time that he's arrested in Jerusalem, at the, it's as recounted in the Acts of the Apostles at the end, chapter 25, 26, 27, 28, He's never free again the rest of his life. There are some commentators who think that maybe during his time of imprisonment in, in Rome that at one moment he might have been released for a small amount of time. And that he went to Spain. Because he says in one of his letters that it always had been his intention. But we have no proof of that. We have no, it's just some of the commentators saying perhaps he did actually make it there. Of course, the Spanish like to say that he made it there. But what we have with the Ephesians and the letter to the Colossians and the letter to the Philippians and Philemon, these letters are what we call the letters of captivity. They are letters written by a man who has preached the gospel, announced the salvation of the world over decades now, over 20 years. And who has reflected on these things and who writes to the faithful to have them be illumined. Think differently. If you think like your pagan neighbor thinks or your pagan colleague thinks, there is a profound problem because you are not a disciple of Christ if you think like the world. That is to be illumined. To be illumined is not to think like the world and then tack on a rosary on occasion. That is just a hodgepodge, mishmash and ultimately schizophrenic because it's not a transformation of the spirit. So actually this chapter three that we have read today, St. Paul, it's actually a, a digression. All of these lines are actually, he's doing an aside as he's dictating this letter. He begins by talking about the mystery. And that's why there's a hyphen, I think, even in the text that I printed in your bulletin. There's a hyphen, certainly, in the lectionary they've put in grammatically. Because he begins to start talking about the mystery, and this is why I'm in prison for this reason, and then there's a foom. Off he goes into his side and a reflection, as he often actually does in his letters. But this is one of those moments. Because he stops, he's writing to them in chapter one about what is the mystery? What is this reality? What is the expression of God's mind personally for creation that has existed with God from all eternity before anything existed outside of God, before creation, that he's now announced and revealed to us in this world? in our generation. And that just takes him off, woof, he's gone. And he starts talking about the mystery in this digression, that what is this mystery? The mystery is Christ himself, God made man, God and man in the single person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says this is the unique path of salvation. This is the unique revelation of God's plan, of his desire that humanity and subsequently each individual man and woman find their healing, find their salvation, find their perfection in that illumination which is to find union with God and man. But that union of God and man is found in our Lord. That is the mysterium. That is the thing that has been hidden from before creation and why creation exists is for the Lord Christ. And he is so overwhelmed in prison about how magnificent this thing is that in this reality, this is the path of salvation. Again, Christianity is not a religion like other religions. 
Christianity is Jesus Christ. Christianity is the path of the union between God and man. And it is the only mysterium. It is the only path. And the church being Christ, you cannot, it's why the church teaches very logically, you cannot be saved outside the church. There is one God, one creation, one healing, one salvation, one union with that one God personally. And again, as we always make the distinction, it's not about a philosophical knowledge of God. Of course, God is everywhere. We thought about this, considered this last week. But why a temple in Jerusalem? Why something that we can visibly identify? Because we need that. Not because God needs that, but because we need that. But God's desire to show that what you were created for is not simply to eat and drink and have grandchildren, but is to find a union with infinite charity and infinite wisdom that is God. That's the thing for which we've created. That's the voice telling a stupid 19-year-old, hang on, because you don't know yet. And at 20, hang on, because you don't know yet. And as I said, I am profoundly grateful this idea of being hounded down by grace. That the, all of the saints in this world that have ever made it to holiness have been haunted by the grace of God. I've said to many of the young men, some of the young women, a vocation haunts you. It will always be there saying, but you're supposed to do more. That is illumination. And again, as I said, if we think like our pagan colleagues who just think by the world, that doesn't require anything. There's no grace there. There's nothing special. There's nothing supernatural. It's just what you do. That has always been the foundation of the world. And that's fine in itself. It leads to a lot of sins often. But it's insufficient to find the healing and the redemption and the purpose for which is God himself. That's what St. Paul is doing here in this digression. And he says, is this not magnificent? This thing that was hidden from all eternity has been given to me, the least of all the consecrated, the holy ones. He says in another letter, the least of all the saints, I persecuted the church of God and God still gave it to me to be a messenger to bring that salvation to others. And not just to Israel, but to everyone, to all of the nations of the earth, that every human being should have the opportunity to enter into this union. But again, outside of Christ, outside of the church, this is not possible. Because the very re reality and the reason why the church exists is that it incarnates the very word itself that God is incarnate. This is why the church from the very beginning spread and communicates and says, do you not want to find healing? Do you not want to find illumination that will dump your world upside down on its head and transform everything the way you see it? Once you go through that fire, it is gloriously beautiful. Until that time, it is painful. That is conversion. That is the purgations. That is the ascetic life. That is the transformation of turning everything on its head. And St. Paul in this digression says that this was not even made, this is made known to the angels themselves through the church. That's how important the church is. With all of its human blemishes, it is still in her essence, Christ incarnate on the world, in the world, in this generation, here and now. Recognizable, visible, handed down continually from generation to generation. And so St. Paul says this is magnificent. I am such a wretch and yet God gave it to me. This has not been announced to other generations. It's not been given to other men to know. But in our generation it has been revealed. Is this not beautiful? This is a man who is in prison. In another place in his letters he will say, I am shackled, but the word of God is not shackled. 
There are far too many Catholics who live wringing their hands all the time. Oh, we have to make the gospel more palatable. We have to be welcoming is the catchword these days. What does that mean? That's like having officials and say, I'm not going to actually put you on chemo or to do some treatment or surgery because it will cause you pain. You'll have a convalescence. You'll be racked, you'll be racked up for six months in bed. No physician's going to say, I'm not going to do surgery or help you with your tumors and your cancer or whatever it may be because there will be an effect of convalescence. So it is absurd to try to present the gospel in a way that a pagan finds completely very intelligent and nice because it's telling you it's not the gospel anymore. You've diluted it down to some form of paganism. And why are the, this is fresh in my mind because there was an article in the paper a couple weeks ago on how since the 90s it just goes down and down of religious attendance. It doesn't matter. Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, they're all emptying out. But they're all emptying out, at least as far as the church goes, is because we're not actually preaching the integrity of what it means to be illuminated. This will cost you. This will be painful. Because coming from a secular background, it has to be changed, or else you cannot enter the path of salvation. St. Paul is in chains for years, imprisonment, being beaten, being flogged, being dragged to Rome. All of these things are there because of the gospel. He doesn't turn around and say, oh, well, maybe this was excessive. Maybe this is extremist. The gospel is very clear, the apostolic tradition. You just have to know it, the catechism. It gives it to you in capsulized form. That's what we communicate. But when we walk around on eggshells worried about whose feelings are going to be offended about this or that, the purpose is not to offend. But I can assure you that as a 19-year-old at the seminary, there were many, many things I had to work changing in my life. At the level of my schedule, at the level of the life I lived, at the level of my imagination, and the level of my intellectual thinking. In fact, when I look back on it now, and the way I lived through high school, I marvel at the fact that I ever made it to the doors of the seminary in the first place. That's the digression today. Is this not a beautiful gift? Is this not magnificent? But at the same time, the question is, does this not burn? And the answer to both of these questions is absolutely yes. But that, the word of God, is not shackled. This is a magnificent text. In fact, there are many who think in the commentators that this letter was written specifically to be read liturgically. It is so solemn, Ephesians. Colossians are so solemn. In fact, we call it the letter to the Ephesians, but in many of the earliest manuscripts, it doesn't have that title. So clearly, for commentators also, it looks to be a circular letter. And it may be actually the lost letter to Laodicea, because he talks about having written a letter, but we have no copies, we have nothing of it. And this may be the one that went to Laodicea and it's meant to be passed around to all the other churches. And in the end, the manuscripts that we wind up having are finished with Ephesians at the top of it as an address. These are exquisite considerations. And so we need to ask the Lord God to give us patience and endurance because the preaching of the gospel that is given to us in order to transmit will always cost. But once we've, as I said, once we've walked through that fire, that transformative fire, it is gloriously beautiful and profoundly in peace. This is why the martyrs, having walked through that fire, they can stand in front of beasts in the arena and be eaten by lions, destroyed by bears, because they are elsewhere. They, are in the in they have already entered into that mysterion of God-made man, the path that brings union. These people in the arena, these martyrs, and as Maronites, of course, our entire heritage is filled with martyrs. People who die century after century because of the faith so that we in this century may believe. We need to imitate those same footsteps so that 800 years from now, if we make it that long, 
800 years from now, others will believe because we have been faithful in our generation. But we cannot be faithful in our generation if we do not consent to walk through the illuminating fires. And that's why so many tens of millions of Catholics have just dropped everything. They did not want to walk through fire. And the voice that came to them and said, but just one more step, you will learn so much more, except to be illuminated. And they went, where's the bag of chips? Where's the remote for Netflix? And off they went into this fantasy world of frivolity and superficiality. And that suffocates and kills. That's why I said we live culturally in a world that works to smother us with marshmallows. But smother is still the end effect. Marshmallows or lions, it doesn't make any difference. In the end, we die. But the difference being is that when the martyrs die with the animals, they find that union of the mysterion, and the rest of us go to hell. So ask St. Paul that he obtain for us a profound desire to enter into the illumination, come what may, because we know that he's sustaining us to walk through those illuminations and that fire as he reworks our spirit completely and at the same time, never forget, strengthening our will to proceed toward a future which is Christ. And that's why I began with the quotation that we'll finish with again. He says, so don't be disheartened by my afflictions. Don't be upset, Ephesians, that I'm in prison because these truly are your glory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father and the Lord of all ages, God from God, life from life, to God from to God, begotten of my name, come substantial of the Father, who hid him all things from me, for us to stand and for our salvation, the King of God and Heaven. And by the Holy Spirit, by the time of the fruit of the earth, and the King of Man. For I was saved, which is crucified in the cross of Pilate, who suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in the accordance of the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and he sits here at the right hand. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, the best soul into the cross. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the day and the life of the world to come. We tell you of my dear Maida Loho, Alvotan Loho, Jampadetayo, 
upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. <clears throat> As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and the Prophet Samuel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered, for the remote intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Continue with the anaphora of St. John the Apostle on page 815, 815. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, <coughs> you are, <coughs> excuse me. 
Lord God and Father, you are true love, security that is ever sure and hope that never fails. Grant love, happiness, and everlasting peace to your children here before you. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and souls. And with the holy kiss, we're worthy of your blessed name that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor of love and faith that are pleasing to God. O Lord, as we bow before your majesty, send us your grace and glorious blessings from the heights of your heavenly sanctuary, that we may reign, glorify you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, you sent your beloved Son at the appointed time for our salvation. And he gave us these holy and life-giving mysteries. Do not look upon us as strangers and do not turn your holy face away from us because of our many sins. For you alone are the Holy One with your only Son and your Holy Spirit now and forever. of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We <coughs> Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and just to praise you, O Lord, of all in heaven and on earth. The powers on high in the heavens where they dwell glorify you. The fiery ranks exalt you, the cherubim bless you, and the seraphim worship you. They cry out and they proclaim. Spirit, born in the visible of nature, and we sanctify all things by your divine power. For our salvation, we send your Son to the world. For our salvation, you sent your Son into the world. He descended, became flesh, suffered, and was crucified for us, who had distorted his image. Pretty <laughs> Hono denita 
دمو دیلا دیاتی کی خدا تو دخل و فای کن و خلق ساگیم میتی شد و میتی هم خوصون خواب و خوی دن قلم علمین in memory of me for whenever you eat this body and drink this blood you proclaim my death until I come again and all await the reward they deserve and when you place the sheep to the right and the goats to the left do not look upon us as strangers to your household and do not turn your holy face away from us do not let our sins and offenses pierce your holy heart and do not separate us from you for we have professed your holy name and have proclaimed your divinity. Rather treat us according to your promises. Forgive our sins, pardon us, and have mercy upon your inheritance. For this your repentant church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, As we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. You spoke through the prophets and you crowned the holy apostles and martyrs. May you descend upon these mysteries and sanctify them. Manin Mario, Annin Mario. Annin Maria, Nite Mordor of Hail Kodisho, on the Hen Line of Alcorbono, oh no. May these holy mysteries sanctify the bodies and souls of those who share in them, cleanse their hearts, purify their thoughts, and be a pledge of the heavenly kingdom and new life forever. Remember in this sacrifice all the holy churches and the shepherds of the true faith, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops. With them, we remember the priests, the deacons, and all who serve your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. For the peace and stability of the whole world, for a blessed and prosperous year, for an abundant harvest, for the sick and the oppressed, for all who call upon your holy name on land, at sea, or in the air, and who profess that you are the true God, we pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, those who have presented the offering upon this holy altar, and those who desired to do so but were unable, 
and grant them their petitions. We pray to you, O Lord. We remember all the saints, the fathers, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, Mary, the mother of God, St. Joseph, St. Jude, and Samuel the prophet, and all the righteous and the just. Through their prayers, make us worthy to stand among them. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, in your grace, those who have left us and have gone to you from the first Christian disciples to this day. They were signed with the seal of baptism and received the precious body and blood of your Son. They wait for you in your life-giving hope. Raise them up on the last day and in your mercy forgive all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us on the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. petitions. You taught us through your beloved Son to stand before you and to call upon you with pure souls and with clear consciences praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are thine now. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation and from harm of evil, for you have power over all, and we raise glory to you now and forever. Shlomo Elokurchunna, O Lord, in your grace and abundant mercy, bless those who bow before you. Make us worthy to share in your life-giving mysteries and to join the assembly of your saints, that with them we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, 
Be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <clears throat> to him be glory forever. <clears throat> sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. <clears throat>
again and again. We thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
Gracious God and Father, how can we repay you for your goodness and for the salvation you have just given us? Who can give you the glory you truly deserve? In our weakness, and insofar as we are able, we worship, praise, and thank you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo elokolchona. Jesus Christ, our God, we worship, thank, and praise you. We implore your goodness and your abundant mercy for the salvation of the whole world, for the protection of the living and eternal rest to the departed, for the feeding of the hungry and the support of the needy, for the visiting of the sick and the consolation of the grieving. Through your grace, rest dwell in them, and by your abundant mercy give them life. By your victorious cross, bless your people and protect your inheritance. Adoration is due to you, to your Father, and to your holy and life-giving Spirit, now and forever. <clears throat> so there are just two announcements. One is to point out that in the midst of our illumination, St. Paul uses a term in the epistle of boldness of access. That I will actually have to speak on at 11 o'clock. The, the Greek word is parousia. Parousia is more than boldness. Boldness can be pushy. But that word in Greek actually means the boldness of children. To have the excess of like that little three-year-old stomping around the kitchen asking grandma for cookies. At 23, it's obnoxious. At three, it's adorable. And that is precisely the boldness that St. Paul says belongs to those who enter the fire in the mystery. The second thing is, you will also see within the bulletin, is that after four years, our bishop will finally be back to visit. There have been many, 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 many people who have benefited over the last two years because our bishop encouraged us to stay open. I highly encourage you to let every single individual that you have known in New Hampshire, in Maine, who have benefited from that generosity of apostolic zeal, that you bring them in on September 11th to the reception and they can thank him personally for that apostolic openness, welcoming, and profound sense of the flock. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishments and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.